Hello, so welcome everyone to this very, very interesting uh, conversation. And first, let me introduce you to uh, the moderator uh, of today, Diana Steffi. She's co-founder of the Future of the, uh, Station. So, so Diana, uh, go yes. ahead. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin, for the introduction. Thank you, Vanessa, for arranging this uh, and, and making this uh, uh, happen, happen. It's a great honor for me to uh, host this discussion about future of media uh, with the three uh, amazing panelists that we have today. Please do allow me to uh, introduce them. Uh, so, Diane, um, our first guest, Diane Francis, uh, she's an award-winning journalist. Uh, she's editor at large at the National Post in Canada, uh, and she writes to various uh, periodicals around the world, and she speaks to a lot of conferences about technology, geopolitics, and the future of journalism. So welcome, Diane. We are very happy to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Um, let's move on. I hope Jimmy hears us now. Uh, we do have uh, Jimmy Wells with us, or if you allow me to call it like this, as you have it on your LinkedIn profile, the wiki guy. Uh, and Jimmy and his team just landed a really cool new uh, platform, a social networking platform focused on, on news. And we will be hearing uh, more about that uh, after we do the introduction um, of all the guests. But I do encourage the audience to check uh, um, wt.social uh, in order for you to see the transformative and the empowering purpose that the, uh, the Wiki Tribune Social uh, comes, uh, uh, comes on the market. Uh, Jimmy, welcome uh, to our panel. It was very interesting to use Wikipedia uh, to document on the other speakers, but <laughs> especially to document on the founder of Wikipedia. Uh, and with this occasion, I also want to welcome all the people from the Wiki community that are joining us today. Happy to have you here, Jimmy. Yes, great. great. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm really looking forward to this. Great, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, and last but not least, um, I would like to also introduce uh, Salim Ismail. Great, great to be here. Start, I would like to um, start with a little bit more general question. Um, and that is because we are witnessing this interesting times um, where we see a lot of significant media polarization. So I just wanted to see how you are perceiving the evolution of media in the last period of time. Um, and if possible, I might like to start with Diane because uh, uh, as I was reading your biography, Diane, I've noticed that for almost 20 years, you are now contributing to the National Post. Uh, so we would very much like to hear your insights and then of course, continue with the gentlemen if they wanna add something. Yeah, um, I, I want to talk about the legacy media, which is my roots. That's broadcasting through networks, through radio station broadcasters, as well as newspapers and magazine periodicals. Uh, the legacy media is, uh, this is hardly news, on the ropes. Uh, newspapers are burning their furniture uh, to stay alive. So networks will be out of business. The major networks on television uh, will be out of business beginning in 2021 because the uh, advertising model, as happened to the newspaper model, is blown up because of digital, uh, the digital reach of social media and other things. And they are losing uh, all the sports teams, for instance, which are about 80% of their revenue are going to have their own channel. So the networks are gone. And so what you've got is you've got legacy media. And by legacy media, I would say that not always well done, but the aspiration was curation, accuracy and peer review. That was the aspiration of legacy media. It wasn't always executed properly. And of course, in countries that have tyranny and censorship, the, 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 the so-called journalists in those countries were nothing more than propagandists. And so they were, but they were also peer reviewed, but by censors and that sort of thing. And their accuracy was measured by the disinformation that they spewed according to what the government of the day wanted them to. So I'm talking about the, the discipline in itself. What we see now is, is uh, and I must uh, give kudos to Jimmy Wales, uh, Wikipedia is the most important thing that the internet has done. Uh, I have mixed feelings about Google because Google 
Um, Google was a, what's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, Google, Google stole our, stole our content and didn't pay us for it, which is the reason why we're all burning the furniture and going out of business. However, what Jimmy has done is something really important. And there is curation, there's footnoting, there's, there's you know, online real-time corrections to the content based on accuracy or new information coming in. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely spectacular what you've done, Jimmy, and I think it's made all the difference because in the maelstrom of so-called media and so-called journalism, you are at least one important benchmark against which people can be held accountable. So I gotta say that I think the new journalism is Wikipedia. <laughs> Maybe Jimmy, you want to add something to that? Is uh... yeah, I mean, after I stop blushing, um, I'll, I'll try <laughs> to think something. Uh, it's good. It's matching your shirt. So. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, I think we can also talk. I, I agree with everything uh, that Diane had to say, especially how great Wikipedia is, of course. But. Uh, um, we, I think we can also talk about some of the things that are in a business sense working in the media, but how they are contrary to what we really want uh, from the media and from journalism. So one of the problems that I see us facing is that we now have an ecosystem uh, of, you know, we, we, when, when, when you've got a pure advertising only business model, that definitely leads you in the wrong direction in lots of ways. And that is exacerbated when we have uh, major drivers of traffic that are also purely advertising model driven. So the social networks uh, in particular, their, their incentive structure is naturally to keep you clicking, to keep you viewing as many uh, ads as you can on their site. So they want you on the site, they want you addicted. And as we all know, and many quality media organizations have struggled with this, what this means is to get traffic in that a world, what you need is uh, clickbait headlines. Uh, you need to target readers with bias, uh, sort of outrage, the kind of centrist narratives uh, where we say, let's look in a serious way at all sides of this issue, don't perform very well in that environment. Wikipedia, frankly, doesn't perform very well in the social media sharing environment. That isn't how we get our traffic. Uh, you've never seen a Wikipedia entry sort of go viral because it has a great clickbait headline. Uh, and so, what does this mean? It's meant that um, a lot of media organizations have really struggled with the question, look, we can spend a lot of money uh, doing some serious, thoughtful journalism, and it's expensive. You've got to hire senior reporters who have deep contacts, who know what they're doing. And then you, you publish your story, and you may find that on that day, you made just as much money from a cute little listicle that some, uh, you know, clever 20-year-old wrote. And the business model is broken. It doesn't really work. Now, there are some, some positive signs that we are seeing. I'm very excited to see, for example, the New York Times go from 1 million to 4 million digital subscriptions, because I think once you have readers paying, that fundamentally changes uh, the, the formula. And even though I rant against this advertising model a lot, I, I think in the olden days for newspapers, it was one of the pillars and it was okay. You know, you had, you had advertising revenue, you had uh, classified ads, that was lovely revenue because, you know, people selling their cars is not inducing bias. Um, and then you had uh, the uh, reader revenue, so subscriptions and so on. And some of the reader revenue is beginning to come back now. I think that's very exciting. But what I've started to really look at is to say, look, there's something deeper wrong with the ecosystem. And the existing social networking platforms are not really fundamentally making people happy in a genuine human sense. They keep us addicted, they keep us clicking, uh, they serve a certain purpose, they aren't all completely terrible, but fundamentally we're not getting out of them what we really want. Uh, we, we want, humans want to understand the world they live in. They want to grow as people, they want to learn, they want to understand the people they disagree with. Not everybody, of course, but enough people that it makes Wikipedia more popular than any newspaper in the world, and enough people that we see the discontent. We see lots of people saying, wait a minute, this whole thing is, is noisy, but it's broken. It's not giving me what I want. So anyway, I, 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 I I'm always call myself a pathological optimist, uh, but on this topic, I can sound quite pessimistic sometimes. But I do think, I think we'll get through this. I think we'll find ways to structure the environment in a better and more healthy way 
to, so that people can actually say, you know what, I, I, want, I want to be challenged in my views. I want to read something thoughtful and interesting that I disagree with. And if, mm -hmm. if we can devise mechanisms for that, I think we're going to make a, a big step forward. Thank you, Jimmy, for that. So uh, if I were to sum up a little bit of the discussion so far, uh, I heard about quite some problems that media is currently facing. Uh, and I think it's very good if we kickstart it like this and we understand some of the current problems and then we uh, look up for some uh, proposals of solutions or uh, how we can see a way forward. Um, so we have uh, a low trust uh, in, in media. That will, could be one of the problems. If we look at the Edelman barometer that was done for 2019, in a lot of the countries, media, it's actually the least trusted institution still. Uh, two, we have the different business models or the legacy business models that don't seem to thrive in the future uh, anymore. Uh, plus, uh, we don't really have that much uh, collaboration between the different media sources. Uh, and I would like to pass it on to Salim um, and see how, how, if you want to add to some of those problems that you, we are witnessing before we get to the solutions. Yeah, I think there's I think there's two or three very key problem spaces that I, I would love to hear uh, what what are we seeing and how can we solve this. I think the the number one is uh, the business model problem, where we had in the uh, traditional world, as Diane pointed out, a very clear set of business models for media, and typically government would would license the BBC or license give licenses to CBS or NBC to broadcast over the airwaves, uh, etc. And, and now, as, as people started to go down a profit motive, um, we basically turned that, the, the, all the incentives are to be more and more polarized to get more and more click-throughs. And so you end up with extreme left or extreme right and not a lot of common sense in the middle because it doesn't click uh, very well. Uh, and so I think the big challenge is the, the business model. And I think the really big question I would love to hear from Diane and Jimmy is, is are we seeing anything where we're finding business models for investigative journalism? Um, because this is the, for me, the core of it. If you don't have a business model for investigative journalism, then essentially we lose freedom, we lose democracy globally. And we're seeing that around the world now uh, as, as journalists are getting uh, clamped down on by by um, governments uh, who have no incentive in, in looking deeply into this. And I think, Diane, your work on the Ukraine is profound. I want to do two quick shout outs. Um, I was doing a, a, I've been in this news journalism space for about 20 years as an observer uh, from a startup I did. And I met Diane because she wrote up an, an article about our startup that described our startup way better than we could describe it, which was kind of embarrassing. Uh, but it <laughs> speaks to the clarity of thought that she brings to everything she does. And along that journey, I met Jimmy through the uh, Web 2.0 blogging world and, and been watching what's going on. And it's just amazing to me that we've not found a collective solution to this. And I think there's two buckets. I think there's the people in the journalism world that are, that are um, uh, stuck in that model and don't know quite how to get out of it. And then there's the pure technologists and the platforms like the Googles and Facebooks that have a completely different agenda. And we've not been able to bring the two uh, together. And, and I just go to the, the problem of abundance versus scarcity. We, all of our news um, uh, media and news uh, systems were created in an environment where information was scarce. And the journalism was essentially the source of that information. Uh, and now we have an abundance of information uh, which can get misused, misinterpreted, faked. And frankly, every major democracy in the world is broken because of that. And we have to figure out how to navigate this. And we have a very little time uh, on which to do it. There's a bunch of people that are kind of deeply working in the space, the Jeff Jarvis's, the Jay Rosen's, Craig Newmark was doing some incredible work. Um, but we're kind of, the, the one thing that I've seen that's very uh, interesting is Hypothesis, a, a nonprofit out of uh, San Francisco. And what they're doing is they figured out how to annotate phrases. So if somebody made a, makes a false claim, uh, you can essentially have groups of people tagging it and saying, I call bullshit on that. And you do essentially real time fact checking. And that's a start, but it doesn't solve the business model problem. So the one question I would love to see answered from uh, you folks, Diane and, and Jimmy, is what business models are you seeing and how do we solve the business model problem for investigative journalism? So if I could come out of this call with that, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd, I'd absolutely love it. 
Well, I'll jump in first. Uh, there, there are only four areas where investigative journalism uh, has, has perpetuated. Uh, first of all, in the legacy media, because you know whether it's the New York Times or the New York Post, the reality of it is that most people who buy both of those papers and pay for them were, were drawn to entertainment pages, sports coverage, you know, silly, fluffy, whatever's astrology, all kind, you know, bridge columns, the crossword puzzles, all those 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 entertainment, fluffy, soft stuff were also part of the content offering. But those things paid the bills so that investigative journalism could be undertaken over and above the coverage of news and all the fluff. So that the investigative journalism still exists and the New York Post and the Washington, the New York, uh, Washington Post and the New York Times are leading the charge there. Uh, the other model is uh, polling is very expensive, but very important to any, any business or, or polity. And polling now is being done by the Pew Foundation. Foundations are getting involved in providing the kinds of services that were investigative and helpful and diagnostic that traditional journalism used to be able to cover and pay for. The third thing is think tanks. I write for American Interest. I write for the Atlantic Council. They are uh, they provide con they provide content providers like myself a place, and they curate the content that can speak to arcane topics that don't make mainstream newspapers that are looking for the widest possible audience. And so the think tanks are very important, although at the same time, it's important to see who the uh, donors are to the think tanks, uh, just as it's important, as Jimmy pointed out, to make sure that General Motors and IBM and the pharma companies aren't paying all the, the bills for a new newspaper, because that does skew the content coverage and curation. So I would say those four things. And then there are, you know, just public service, pro publica. Those are volunteer OCCRP does some of the best white collar crime and deep crime uh, investigations in the world. And that's done by volunteers. And that is not sustainable for very long. And nor is it sustainable when you're doing dangerous work, which is often the case with investigative stuff. So, you know, those are the four outlets right now for it. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's, it's adequate, but it's not obviously not good enough. So, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the, the, the business models, the, the two things that I've seen uh, that I think are interesting is, is one, the resurgence of subscriptions online. Uh, that's been very important. And I think that is something that can be carried forward. However, there is a, a problem there because it, so far, it, it, it works well for, and it's always worked well for the financial papers uh, for a different set of reasons, uh, but, but those are quality sources of, of information. It's worked well for the New York Times, which is a national, actually a global brand. It, it doesn't seem to be making much inroads in a place like my hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, a town of 200,000 people that effectively doesn't have a local newspaper anymore. The Huntsville Times is when I was a kid, I <clears throat> delivered newspapers uh, on my bicycle in the suburbs and uh, it was seven days a week and now they publish three days a week and even that overstates it because they, it's published out of Birmingham 100 miles away. It's largely the AP Newswire. As, in terms of local journalism, it's been destroyed. And there's actually a problem which is it's hard to see how do you come back from that? How do you persuade people locally to pay to subscribe digitally to that paper when they look at the paper and they say, it's the same, it's the AP Newswire, it's the same thing I see everywhere. There's no local journalism. So there's gotta be a rebirth of investment before we can think uh, people are gonna be able to do that locally. And then finally, I, I was on the board of the Guardian uh, newspaper here in the UK for about a year. And you know they went through this period of losing 80 to 100 million pounds a year uh, at that time, they had about 800 million in their trust fund. So the, the Guardian is owned by a nonprofit trust. So it's an unusual model. Uh, the paper itself is a for-profit, but the, all the profit goes to the trust. So it's effectively a nonprofit. And went through a very, very tough time. But one of the things that they did is they've really dramatically increased uh, the reader revenue by just asking the readers. Um, and everybody's seen the yellow box at the bottom. Uh, so with, with the Guardian, they, they have a sort of an ideological um, 
thing against paywalls. They really want it to be a paper for everyone. Uh, they have, I, I always sort of joke about this a little bit, they have a pretension of being uh, a, a left-leaning working class newspaper when the truth is they're an urban liberal newspaper. Um, but you know, that's, they, they want everybody, you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to have money to be able to buy The Guardian, even though everybody reads The Guardian has money, but that's a different story. But what is interesting about it, that, that you know, I, I take a little bit of the blame and none of the credit for, for what they did, because I said to them at, at the time when I was on the board, the membership proposition was about discounted museum tickets and early tickets to Guardian events. And I said, you know what, people, they love the Guardian. There's even this term Guardianista, which refers to the people who love the Guardian. They just want to give you money. So stop offering tote bags because nobody wants a tote bag. They just want to give you money. So just say to them, if you love the Guardian, we need your help. Give us money. And, and that's been successful. They've just turned their first operating profit in a very, very long time, small. Um, and the word operating profit also suggests there's depreciation and stuff that's not quite covered yet. But uh, the point is, that reader revenue component is beginning to work in a lot of organizations. I think that needs to be pushed further forward. And there's opportunities around uh, apps. Uh, you know, the, 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 the one click ability to pay is very important that people can pay. I mean, one of the issues there, and I think there should be a lot of public pressure on Google and Apple to say the, the percentage of money you take from in-app purchases is unconscionable when we're talking about public interest journalism. It's one thing to say, this gaming company is taking advantage of our platform to do Fortnite or whatever. I don't really care, that's a business negotiation between them, but I think it would be a wonderful thing if they said, look, this is a public interest uh, in journalism and news, we're gonna pass more of the money through to them just as a gesture that we actually care about the environment that we operate in and the world isn't completely broken. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other thing. But it's a very interesting evolution, Jimmy, from delivering uh, newspapers on the bike to delivering wikis to the world, because I just read that you are still editing a lot of the Wikipedia content on a daily basis. Um, and talking about disrupting business models, yeah. Talking about disrupting business models, maybe you can share with the audience a little bit more on the new uh, platform that you are working, the Wiki Tribune. Sure. Um, so yeah, so with, with Wiki Tribune, um, it's, a, it's a project I've been working on for a couple of years, and our first try at this was really an exploration and didn't work. It was to say, let's re-examine the relationship of the community and the journalists. Let's see how we can work together in new ways. Parts of that were, were great, parts of it didn't work. But what I realized is it was impossible to get traffic because the, the whole ecosystem is broken. When we looked at, you know, how do we get more traffic? How do we get more attention? immediately your mind goes to, we need more clickable headlines and we need more shareable content. And I was like, I don't wanna do that. That's, I, I'm not here to make another Buzzfeed. Um, and so what I've done now is to say, let's reimagine the whole thing. Let's talk about that, that broader environment, a social network. What is wrong with social networking? So I've launched WT Social as a social network uh, with no advertising, uh, no paywall. So I've been joking a series of bad business decisions, but that's how I've built my career so far. And the idea is just to say, look, if, if and, and again, what I believe, I have a very strong belief that organizations in their DNA inherently follow the money. You can have a high vision, but if the money is telling you to do something different, you're gonna do something different. And it's really hard to, to resist that. And so the idea is like, look, if, if I have advertising as my business model, then what do I need? I need you to see as many ads as possible. I need to maximize your time on site. I need to have content that's addictive. I need to, you know, you go right down the same path as everybody else. But if I say, look, we don't have ads <clears throat> and you don't have to pay unless you want to, why would anybody pay? And, and for me, the same, it's the same. Why would anybody pay for Wikipedia? You don't have to pay. Like literally nothing's gonna happen if you don't pay, <clears throat> but people do. People pay, a lot of people pay. Uh, only a small percentage of people, so not everyone, but enough people pay because they say, you know what, this is meaningful. This is something that is, is important to my life. I feel it's transformative to the world. It's worth supporting, and I should do that. And so if I set up a business model that says, look, nobody's gonna pay me unless I do something meaningful for them, then that's my incentive to really think about, okay, how do we focus on 
quality experience? How do we focus on getting the best content to people, the things that they really, at the end of the day, they say, wow, like, this is good, this is meaningful, as opposed to saying, I've got to get back on Twitter immediately to see what that idiot said, and if I have to yell at them again, right, which is, I'm afraid, a tragic part of my own life, and, um, you know, it's not healthy, it's not what we want. Instead, I want to be like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go look on the internet, uh, I've got 20 minutes, I'm going to read something, I'm going to read something good and interesting, and if WT helps me find that, then I'm going to chip in at the end of the year and say thanks for the service. So that's what I'm working on. And, and it's so far 400,000 people have signed up. So that's good. Uh, and more than I was hoping to see one in 200 paying, but it's a little bit better than that even. So people are paying. I mean, we're still tiny, uh, three developers, uh, three community people and me. So it's, it's, we're, we're tiny, but we're really focused on how do, we, how do we take the next steps? What are the next things we need to build to engage people in a new way? Great, thank you for sharing that, Jimmy. And just out of curiosity, how many people, what's the percentage of people actually contributing to the Wikipedia? Oh, to Wikipedia? Like the, yeah, in oh, donations? Uh, the, oh, in terms of donations, we have a, I don't really know the ratio. We, we don't keep track of that very well, but we have over 5 million unique donations every year. Um, we just raised just over 100 million last year. Uh, the vast majority of the money is those small donations. We do get a little bit of uh, sort of major donor money, but it's not a huge part of our revenue. Um, and so, and, it, and actually a lot of it comes from the email campaign. Uh, so we put the banners on the site and that, that brings in a fair amount, but a lot of people, uh, they get the email uh, and then they, they're, they're loyal. We have loyal donors. They come year after year after year. They get the email that says, hey, it's been a year, it's time to donate again, and they do. Um, and then uh, we, we have people are now joking a lot about our emails. They're quite dramatic. My wife got one from me. It said, Kate, we have to talk. She was like, oh no, what is this? It's like, she needed to give me Great. some money. <laughs> I'm seeing some people in the audience agreeing with what you are saying. So I do suppose that there are people in this audience that are uh, heavily contributing to the Wikipedia and are donating to this. And we do encourage you to uh, continue doing that. Um, Maybe moving a little bit further, as I want to hear Salim sharing a little bit of more his experience on this. Um, how do you see the leverage between the media industry and the exponential technologies that we are witnessing nowadays, Salim? We move from this uh, current, uh, uh, let's say, the legacy landscape, as Diane was calling it, to a more digital uh, landscape with a lot of platforms. Looking into the future, how is uh, uh, media? showing up you know i, I think there, there's it's it's very good and very bad i think the internet has enabled things like wikipedia which transform our understanding of knowledge and move us past centralized uh knowledge structures which i think is very powerful um i think the net a huge area where we'll end up is uh um, kind of certifications and other things being open sourced in the same way rather than a degree granting organization convening and saying, yes, we are an expert in this, et cetera. Um, it's fascinating to me that if you're uh, with the rise of things like GitHub, for example, which allows software developers to collaborate, um, they use all of the characteristics of, an, of EXOs or exponential organizations. And now it's, uh, if you're a software developer in Silicon Valley, your salary has more, has nothing to do with your degree, your university and the grades you got. It's hundred percent, what's your GitHub rating? Uh, which is a pure dem a meritocracy transparent peer-to-peer -peer. and i think uh, copying some of what made wikipedia work is kind of driving transformation in a very powerful way in all these other domains that we think will keep propagating that's the good news the bad news is that uh, uh, this gets weaponized very quickly um, obama used twitter very very effectively uh, and then and then trump used uh, facebook very very effectively and literally now we have uh, people, uh, the, the fight of the algorithms and people literally not um, uh, um, kind of being able to navigate that. Paul Sappho, one of the more famous futurists and forecasters, has literally said he does not expect the U.S. to exist in 25 years because 40% of the country doesn't live in any kind of reality at all because um, they watch Fox News. And, and you look at the statements, uh, you look at the statements in the, from all of the uh, Republican uh, congressman is literally talking points given by by that. There's no independent thought 
Uh, and, and so now we've got a total corruption of the media um, and the channels around both sides. And how do we lift past that is I think the enormous question. Uh, the, the question I would love to ask uh, both Diane and, and Jimmy is, you know, we, we uh, in the past governments have sanctioned uh, news. The, the, I think the BBC license fee is a classic example of a really good model that worked for a while. And now we're seeing governments all over the world clamp down because we've gone away from that. And, and yet the governments in theory are elected by the people for the people, by the people, and yet they're operating in their own self-interest now. How do we solve that problem? And are you seeing any projects that give you optimism around that particular issue? Because if, if we can't solve or break that link, between governments acting in their own self-interest rather than what's actually best for the people, then we kind of go down a pretty bad path and we're kind of halfway there with many of the democracies in the world already today. Are you seeing anything uh, 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 um, that gives you optimism in that space? Well, I, I just, I'll jump in here. You know, the BBC is very unique because, you know, the, the place is kind of tribal and uh, everybody believes in the Beeb and all of that. And then you have a culture of of journalism going back multi-generations that protects the, the corporation from commercial interests and political interests, or should, but mostly does, uh, as well as pandering to, to the base, the Craven interest. So, so that works pretty well. Uh, we have the CBC, the Canada Broadcasting Corporation in Canada, which doesn't work as well. It's openly biased. Uh, the NPR and the PBS models are a little different. They're mostly, they're, they really don't get into news and investigations that much. They commission them, but so I think that some of that is okay, but I really think the best role of government in a free society is to give tax receipts to people who, who put their money up to start models uh, on their be own behalf uh, in the media space. I think that's the best way, rather than direct involvement, I think that's a slippery slope, and I think it, it always is a slippery slope. And so I'm, I'm less inclined to support that kind of thing. Although, you know, whether it's the Australian broadcasts, Canadian or the British broadcasting corporations, they do an okay job, but they don't really fill the bill either. Uh, I think that the real, the real problem also is, I wanna get into, and I'd like comments on this too, uh, one of the most profound books, I think, that, that really raised my red flags was filter bubbles. The filter bubble phenomenon is an enormous problem. This guarantees that it's not about people's own bias. They're not even going to get the right information because Google, uh, you know, filters all the information that they access, want to access, or have delivered to them based on what they bought or what they looked up before. And the filter bubble thing is really profound. Uh, I, I ran a couple of articles, I wrote a couple of articles a few years ago where I had a friend in Florida search something on Google, someone in California, someone in Mississippi, someone in Chicago, and someone in Canada, the same, the same words and the same phrases, completely different rankings, completely different rankings. And so there is a, a insidious filter system based on, you know, advertising algorithms alone or could be even more pernicious than that and that is a danger and i think that should be illegal yeah it goes straight to the business model problem right all the optimization is to give you stuff that you'll look at and then you end up in this there's a there's a as a highlight i'm just going to put into the chat a an article that for me that really nailed it it came out about uh five six years ago and it was a an article titled the most depressing story about the brain ever that was the Again, clickbait in the title, uh, but some really interesting uh, um, um, uh, findings. What they found was if you are presented with evidence that directly contradicts your uh, uh, politically or religiously held view, um, you end up with three reactions. One is you reject the evidence, and that's understandable. The second was that in rejecting the evidence, the reaction makes your belief system stronger. Um, and the third part, which led to the title of the article, was it turned out the more mathematically literate you were, the more likely you were to reject the evidence. Which <laughs> just depressed the hell out of everybody because you can never have an evidence-based <laughs> argument for something. Our only path is better narrative, which is a, a kind of which is where 
why successful uh, structures have great narrative around them. And John Hegel talks a lot now about the power of narrative in, in how we navigate things, which is why we work with you know, the massive transformative purpose is what is your narrative in how you navigate the world. And I think the combination of that, so here's the, here's the algorithm I'd like to see is an open published algorithm saying, here's stuff that corresponds with your view that you're reading. And here's a few things to, to Jimmy's point earlier, here's a few things that don't correspond with your view, but you should really read. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's some fact-based things that actually objectively give you, so that we bring our high order thinking to bear when we're reading some of the yeah. stuff, responding, going, oh, I, I agree with that, et cetera. And so I don't know if any of you have seen anything like that. You no, know, I've been saying for some time now, if, if I woke up one morning and Facebook said, instead of showing you things we think you're going to like, we're going to show you things that we think you'll disagree with, but that we have some signal, uh, it's of quality. Uh, because I struggle to get out of my own filter bubbles. Um, I struggle to understand people I disagree with. And I find that what the internet is naturally bringing to me isn't helpful uh, in that. So going back to the question about the, the business model and, and the BBC in particular, I live here uh, in London and we've just gone through an election uh, cycle, which was with a, quite a dramatic finish. And what was interesting to me on that topic alone of course, the BBC has always uh, faced accusations of bias one direction or the other, just as Wikipedia does, just as anybody who strives to be neutral and makes a pride point of it, you're going to get pointed out whenever you fail in some regard. But I think most people would say the BBC does a pretty decent job of being really quite straight for the most part. And yet, just after this election, um, Boris Johnson suggested that they're going to undertake a review of the license fee. Uh, which is always a way of threatening the BBC. And Labour also said part of the blame for their loss rested with the BBC. Uh, and so what's interesting about that is one of the things that we definitely see here in the UK, which we're seeing in the US and, and really everywhere, is the rise of filter bubbles of people who are reading media that is really tailored to their worldview and not even hearing the other side of the story. I mean, I uh, visited my parents in Alabama and sat for a day with them as they do every day and watched Fox News. And I was pretty amazed. I was like, wow, this is a completely different universe that they're living in uh, from the one that I'm living in, living in London and reading the New York Times and what have you. And, and by the way, it's of quality. Uh, you know, from their perspective, they're getting news that's interesting and valid for them and what they're interested in. Uh, it's not ranting mostly, but they're susceptible. We're all more susceptible to, to our bubble. So here in the UK, there are several online outlets that are sort of hard left, almost Breitbart-like, uh, sort of very good at viral distribution and so on. We've got the, the, the tabloid press, which is largely right wing and so on. And people are beginning to just live in those worlds. And once you live in those worlds, then when you look at the BBC, you don't see a, a centrist narrative you see and and you've been trained to believe and actually donald trump of course this is his bread and butter that the media is fundamentally corrupt top to bottom that everything you read has an agenda and therefore if you read something you disagree with it's probably because the liberals are behind it or the conservatives wrote it not because it's challenging your worldview in some fact-based way and so culturally we we're gonna have to turn that corner we're gonna have to come back and say gosh, you know, actually, there are people out there who disagree with me who are actually thoughtful, kind people. And I need to understand what we disagree about. And we may still not agree, rather than just saying, I'm going to dismiss everything they have to say because they're horrible, evil people. Um, but. In, in the past, the, the legacy media, and particularly in broadcasting licenses, if you were doing news and comment, you had to provide what they call balance. And that has gone by the wayside, and that certainly is by the wayside in print and everywhere else. And they try and do it, uh, you know. But but there was there was a at least a regulatory requirement that if you were you were using the people's airwaves, that you had to provide left and center and right, mm -hmm. and you pick those. And I think there's some wisdom, as Jimmy mentioned, and and as Celine mentioned, there's some wisdom to that. And, you know, I don't know how you do that, but I think that, and, and we're, not, we're not able to enforce that requirement on our, on our own uh, mind share. You know, a little right, a little left, a little center, not at all. 
And so I think that that is, that is a huge problem. And I think the lack of regulation for social media, uh, this is a big uh, bone of contention for me, to think that just because someone doesn't own a printing press and deliver a physical product, mm. they should be required to ascribe to libel, slander, plagiarism, uh, all kinds of other restrictions that the legacy media has always had to ascribe to and then, then held out accountable to. And that doesn't happen now. It's just, it's just, it's just a wild, wild, uh, wild internet. And it's mm. a problem. Yeah, um, I see that we have Dan Whaley on the line. I mentioned hypothesis earlier. Can I just hack this conversation and ask Dan to speak for a minute about his nonprofit and what he's doing there? Because I think you it's a really interesting welcome. angle. Is that possible? Yes, yes, please do so. We're in the last okay. minute, so uh, go ahead, please. All right, Dan, go for it. Uh, one minute, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A or whatever. Yeah, and yes. if I could just take 15 seconds before that one minute. Um, there's an interesting movement called Steel Manning. Horrible name, but um, it's the opposite of a straw man argument. Um, and it, there's a series of debates that have been uh, organized, some of them in Canada, between people who the first obligation is to be able to articulate the other person's um, argument almost as well or better than they could do themselves before you engage in an exchange of ideas, which I think is just an amazing pattern um, that w could be something that, that first of all takes place outside of the media because the media doesn't, generally doesn't um, sponsor things like that. And one could imagine a, a public dialogue, a real dialogue taking place on meaningful issues um, in ways that could we could draw lots of attention to in terms of, of awareness. Um, we, we, that might be a, a, a way to um, um, improve things. But just uh, one minute on a, on a, a, a hypothesis. The basic concept is on any document or on any page of the web, how could I know the thinking of other people? Like 10,000 people have seen this before me. They may have interesting perspectives. I will never know them because this PDF doesn't have a, you know, any way for me to exchange ideas. So this is like the oldest idea on the web. It goes back to, to um, Vannevar Bush and Ted Nelson and uh, Mark Andreessen built a version of it in, in Mosaic um, in 1993. Um, and it's basically the notion of a distributed, federated um, annotation protocol with a with a data model and a discovery system, um, so that I could I could you know begin to become aware of the of these kind of layers of thinking. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of implement tr trials and implementation over the last 25 years, but nearly all of them have been for profit kind of. Uh, proprietary systems. So the punchline is that a bunch of people got together under the W3C over four years and created a, a formalized a standard called web annotation, um, which which was got passed in 2017. And um, Hypothesis is a, a nonprofit that builds a reference implementation of this. Um, you can you can run it yourself. We run an instance of it, and the goal is to bring uh layers of thinking over the web not a single narrative but more like you know uh um an, in, an infinite l l number of layers of perspective that you could start to um to tune into or become aware of so imagine uh a bill coming out of subcommittee in congress that uh, 500 constitutional scholars have marked up in detail uh in their own kind of group layer uh, you become aware of that, and now you un, you know a little bit more about the uh, uh, particular um, mm. thinking of that. So it's it's catching on quite a bit. I won't bother to go into that. I'll just kind of shorthand it and and say um, you know it's a it's a promising tool for us uh, collectively as we think about um, uh, how to solve some of these problems. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Back to you guys. Thank thank you, Dan. Thank you very uh, much, Dan. You, you can see the link uh, here, and uh, so uh, we can have a we have a very interesting question from Gary. If you can uh, say it directly, uh, unmute yourself and, and say yourself uh, comments. And, and, and uh, I know you have very interesting stuff saying in, in the chat. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, 
Hold on one second. I'm just changing space. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a hundred questions and I've been a fan of Jimmy's and Wikipedia since the site opened. And um, <clears throat> I tell the story often of uh, Jimmy giving a speech long ago where he got uh, congratulatory emails from a whole bunch of people that Wikipedia had a page up on the new Pope, uh, you know, so quickly. And then, he, and then he laughs and he says, well, we had a page on all the major cardinals, so all somebody did when there was white smoke was go to the right cardinal, go to Rot, uh, Rotzinger, uh, change the name of the page, put in a new paragraph, and republish it as like Pope Benedict. And, uh, you know, th this idea that we have history. So back around the same time, I had a briefing from Merrill Brown at MSNBC, and they were doing a whole bunch of sort of innovative webby stuff, trying to make maps and artifacts. And then they would throw this away. Like this was before the Internet Archive existed, before all these things, before anybody was trying to save things. They would, they would code a lot of stuff custom, and then they would chuck it. And I had this idea, why don't news organizations partner with Wikipedia and OpenStreetMaps and whoever else as they come along? And basically, as the news is generated, you build the, the, the artifacts. You, you actually improve these events. Never have. I don't know that even those conversations even have ever opened. I'd love to know from Diane and Jimmy what you, what you all think of this. Why, why haven't news organizations sought to improve our collective wisdom as they made the news? It's expensive. <laughs> no, it's not. A, it, you're, already, you're already doing the expense. How, well, you mean, how, can, how can that be expensive to do? Well, compilation and curation and all of that sort of thing. And then presentation. I mean, it's all very, it's labor intensive. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, I'm, I'm talking from the point of view of the legacy media. Uh, they have their hands full just staying alive and, and covering the news they've got to cover. And so I think this is something that's outside the purview of the legacy media, but it is a, it, it's a good idea, no question. But I think they have trouble staying alive independently because they're trying to exist independently. If they pitched in some of their, you know, infrastructural efforts together, they might actually make a better go of it independently because they would have less to do each of them, is what I'm trying to say. I, I, so I, I think that's probably right, but I mean, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the problems that they face. And, you know, it's, it's like I talked earlier about it would be wonderful if the local newspapers were seeing a resurgence in subscriptions, but they're so weakened that they don't offer a product that people are willing to pay for. And there's, this, there's this chicken and egg problem. Like, and mm. it's easy from outside to say, oh, well, you were so busy trying to survive the sinking of the ship that you didn't bother to like swim down to the bottom and plug the hole. Um, that's easy to say from the outside and, and after the fact, but the truth is these organizations were hit with a, a tsunami of change that were, was very hard to understand. Uh, and that includes things like, yes, you should have partnered with each other uh, 15 years ago to reduce costs in certain ways, but oh, well, that's easy to say now. Uh, I just think it's very hard. Um, we can lament. I mean, I, well, my, my problem is I was, I was saying it then. I was like, when the tsunami was building before they'd gotten shattered by the inner tubes and Craigslist took away you know, classifieds, there was this moment where they could shift their costs and their technology to actually save a lot of money and maybe rescue the ship. But nobody was looking around. They were looking in only, I think. Well, well it, this was done, the... no, it was done. The, the consolidation wave that went through the legacy media in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, combined networks, it combined newspapers, created chains, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that's what, that was done. And a lot of cost savings resulted from that. But, you know, that's over. Now they're mm -hmm. down to the bare bones. And I think, I think uh, um, uh, this is the problem uh, of the immune system. Because uh, anything very new or disruptive, it's hard to actually absorb it, uh, Jerry. And I remember my former business partner went around to all the newspapers in 1995, and he created a, a newspaper in a box technology that connected to their content management systems and would turn in all their newspapers into online pages. And he said to them, why don't you guys all become ISPs? You have a subscription model and a loyal subscriber base. You could instantly become ISPs. And they sat around for three years watching this while AOL rolled up the entire, uh, uh, and this is, the, this is the problem that we need to solve, not just in journalism, but in education and others. The people in the system are, are too unable and stuck to 
to uh, to see outside that in an effective way. And so absorbing that is is kind of the work of our our world now, right? I I always like to to remember examples that are outside of this particular universe to remind us how hard organizational change can be. So my example is uh, Kodak. So Kodak, when the first digital cameras came out, I had a friend who was a scientist, uh, a mathematician who worked at Kodak. His job was solving differential equations about the chemicals coating the film. And I said to him, wow, I mean, it's really fascinating work, but very, very specific. And I said, are you worried about the future? Because the idea that we're gonna be coating film at scale given that I've got a little digital camera that kind of sucks, but you can see what's coming. And they weren't thinking about it. They found it institutionally very, very hard to think uh, in that way. They had a, a very strong legacy business. Yes, it was starting to show some declines. They thought they had time to get out of the way and do things. Anyway, Kodak's dead. And it's not uncommon that organizations who, particularly successful traditional organizations, it's not in their DNA to, to cope with they can cope with incremental innovation reasonably well, but when the entire paradigm's changed, they have no idea, like really their whole business is, is something completely different than it used to be. So even though it's easy for us to look at the newspaper companies and say, oh, well, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. Hey, let's, let's be realistic. Uh, all organizations struggle, like change, dramatic, sudden change. It, it always leaves, you know, occasionally you'll get a company like IBM that managed to survive by completely reinventing itself, um, but nearly died uh, because it couldn't cope with the end of the mainframe. And so I think some of the great media organizations will survive like ABM did, but a lot of them have already died or, or are shells of their former selves. I think it's music to Salim's uh, ears, uh, what you are saying, uh, Jimmy, now. Um, and before closing this, because we are approaching the end of the call, I would really like to take another question. Um, and as Curtis was one of the first one posting it in the chat, um, I do want to invite Curtis to post uh, another question to the panelists, if you want um, you are on mute. Sure. I posted so many. Which one was it? The one about libraries jumping in the game? Yeah, I think that one got the most votes, so. <laughs> okay, awesome. Hey, um, hey guys, uh, I work with libraries in higher ed and universities, and I, <laughs> I, I know the pain with my clients. And uh, li libraries in particular have something to offer here, curation skills, aggregation. I heard a story just the other day about a um, little small town, like it could be Huntsville, Alabama, but it's somewhere in Colorado where the local newspaper is dead. There's just, it can't support local journalism, but they're gonna run a little experiment I might get lucky and get be the, the EXO coach on this experiment. And we're gonna see if we can have libraries fulfill some of those, become the community hub where you have citizen journalists and leverage all the skills and stuff that, that libraries have there. So can we, in, a, in the large, imagine, run some of these experiments and then begin bringing, and libraries need help too. They are really struggling, but they have amazing resources. I mean, I just feel for these people, these librarians and journalists, and we need them both. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. At, at least libraries haven't been accused of being uh, sort of vectors for fake news um, in the yes, way that yeah. the media has. People yeah. still think the library is honest. Although the libraries struggle with the, the impression of uh, being some sort of a, a big building with books in it, uh, like a museum of books. Uh, and they struggle to move with technology in that way. I yeah. love the concept. I love the idea that what a library is, a library fundamentally isn't a big building with books. It's a place where there's smart people who curate knowledge for the community and help anyone who walks in to learn what they want to learn. And that does have relevance when your local newspaper is dead, uh, for sure. So it's an int I've never heard that kind of concept. I think that's very interesting. We might get funding for it. I'll keep you posted. Yep. Right. Thanks. That's great. A library with a layer of uh, exponential organization on top of it. Uh, uh, that, that would sound great. Um, looking a little bit of the time, uh, we really want to thank everybody that has joining this. Uh, for sure, this is not an end to such a discussion and the topic uh, is very excited and we could uh, discuss more and more. Uh, but I just want to thank again to everyone who have joined us. Thank you very much, Diane, for making the time. Uh, Jimmy, for sharing the news and good luck with the Wiki Tribune. Uh, Salim, as always, for um, 
uh, sharing all your uh, knowledge and insights um, on this topics. And uh, I want to pass it on to Edwin to yeah. share some more announcements uh, at the end of the call. Uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, yeah, as you can see, there, there's a lot of passion about the, this topic and the com conversation can follow up uh, again and again. So I want to invite you to, to do a follow up about this. So here in, in Wiki Tribune Social, uh, the idea of this call is we wanted to bring together the OpenExo community with the, the Wiki community because I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. So if you go uh, to Wiki Tribune Social, you will see the fighting misinformation and uh, here I, I, I will create a, with this uh, recording, we will have the transcription, all the links and everything here. Uh, and the idea is to keep coming the, the, the conversation uh, on this. If there's something uh, else, Jimmy, that you think we should be doing around this to keep the conversation, we would like to, to know how to make this wiki conversation uh, follow up better uh, and follow you. So if there's something else that you suggest doing on this, it would be great. Okay, well, we will post uh, here. And uh, Salim, you, you wanted to, to tell last word, so go ahead, uh, just to finish. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is a, obviously a fascinating conversation and we could go on for like hours on this and I think we should. So a um, couple of suggestions, um, just for folks that aren't familiar with our world, uh, we've been working almost exclusively um, on solving that immune system problem. And so for the last five years, leading out from the, the book that we put together, um, Exponential Organizations, we run a 10-week process in big companies that's able to move leadership culture management thinking three years ahead in that 10 weeks. And we've done that now 30 times. We piloted it with Procter & Gamble. But more importantly, a couple of years ago, we actually started this in the public sector. Uh, we have a nonprofit out of Miami called the Fast Track Institute, uh, adapted the process to take 16 weeks, but we can hack a public sector environment. Uh, we just finished with the mayor of Miami on public transportation and the Supreme Court in Colombia to solve the justice system uh, problems there. And so we have figured out how to hack uh, this immune system problem at scale, both in public and private sector. One of my objectives for 2020 is to actually figure out how to do that in institutions like education, journalism, etc. And how do you solve the legacy mindset and move people forward? And so what I'd like to do is reconvene this group um, on a 10-week on a sprint, if you guys are open to it, to let's figure out, because the, the challenge we have in many of these uh, institutions, say like journalism, we don't know what it should look like. We don't have a concept of that. And so what if we got together 15 or 20 of folks like people on this call and painted a picture of what it should look like in say a 20-year period? That at least gives us a target to aim for that people coming up new, with new ideas can uh, ratify against their vision. And so that's something we want to run in the next few months. And if people are open to it, let's go for it. Um, and Jimmy, I'd like to have a separate phone call with you and see, can we move our uh, discussions in our community onto WT Social, right? And, and let's have a separate discussion because the more we can help you with this, the better. Uh, we are literally, our, our mandate and our massive purpose is to transform civilization. And, and journalism is, is kind of the starting point. If we don't solve that, nothing else really uh, solves itself. And if we solve that, then everything else becomes a lot easier. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this one. So let me pause there. Fabulous discussion. And I'd love to continue this on as quickly as possible. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Have Thank you very day. much, everyone. All right. Bye, folks. Great discussion. Bye. Bye.